You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. A lot of town died in South Dakota. If you could get a railroad or if you could get the county seat in your town, that generally preserved the, the town. Uh, there were towns where they had the county seat and the railroad didn't come and they died. And then the county seat ultimately was, was moved away. But if you could get both a railroad and a, and a courthouse there, then you probably were guaranteed that, uh, that the town would survive. The contingent that wanted Belfouche, including Seth Bullock, had a big celebration the day before and had all the cattle cowboys in town. They had horse races and stuff, which is what Seth Bullock was raising here. Anyway, they had horse races and stuff, and so the next day, all those cowboys voted, <laughs> and that's how they lost the election. Somebody from Clear Lake put a post in the ground right out here on the east side of Clear Lake and said, this is the center of the county. This is where it should be. Well, that night then, people from Gary heard about it and they come over and pulled that post out and took the post away. So that got it going, you know. Then there was bickering ever since then. Today, South Dakota has 66 counties and 64 courthouses. Courthouses that are beautiful and majestic, but their history is deeper than architecture. These buildings hold stories of major life events for families and communities. These events and records are preserved within the sandstone, concrete, and wooden walls. Today's South Dakota map would start to take shape as early as 1862, when the Dakota Territorial Legislature would begin establishing many counties. It was the arrival of the railroad that would jumpstart the development and organization of counties across the state. As settlers moved west and sought homesteads in the Dakota Territory, the Missouri River became an important artery for commerce and travel. The first steamboat navigated the river in 1816 and eventually hundreds more would follow. The expansion of the railroad would soon replace steamboat traffic on the river. First railroad came to Vermilion in 1873 and that was really the beginning of the railroad movement. But the, the river traffic kind of died out and everybody was dependent on the railroads. And if the railroad didn't come to the town, um, the town was probably doomed. Many of the county seats were moved away from a town because the railroad uh, didn't go there. Judge Arthur Rush of Vermilion is a fourth generation South Dakotan. He served as a circuit court judge for 18 years, which has been helpful with one of his passions, courthouse history. Throughout his career, Judge Rush has visited every courthouse in South Dakota, not necessarily as a judge, but as a historical fact finder. His efforts have resulted in a book, County Capitals, the Courthouses of South Dakota. Well, I've always been interested in courthouses ever since I was, was a child when my father's office was in the Aurora County Courthouse and he would go to the courthouse and just thought it was a fascinating place. And, whether that had anything to do with my decision to become a lawyer or not, I don't know. But after I became pra started practicing law, I'd been to a number of the courthouses, and they're beautiful buildings and uh, interesting buildings. And so I thought, well, I'd take pictures of them when I went there, and ultimately got into a, a project of trying to visit every uh, courthouse in South Dakota and take pictures of those. And my wife has stories about the detours that we took when we were going across the state of South Dakota so that I could get to some courthouse that I'd not been to before. Most county histories are very good and they would have a chapter or at least several pages in the county history telling about uh, uh, when the courthouse was constructed and giving some of the details about the, the courthouse. But there's some a county history where they just don't even mention the courthouse. History can be dry if you just present it by dates and, and events, but if you tell the stories, everybody loves the stories.
Seth Bullock was one of our famous South Dakotans and was a lawman and a politician in the Northern Hills. Because of his political connections, the county seat was at uh, a, a small town uh, near Belfouche. And uh, that town hired Seth Bullock to lobby with the railroad to make sure that the railroad came to their town so that they could, uh, could continue to have the county, county seat there. And I'm sure they were paying him probably good money to do that lobbying. And unbeknownst to them, uh, he had laid out the town site of Belfouche, owned most of the, the lots in Belfouche, and, which of course is, is very lucrative. If you can get the capital, if you can get the, the county seat, and if you own the lots, the lots are gonna be worth a lot more than, than in a town that's, that's dying. So uh, Seth Bullock was, uh, actually lobbied the railroad to go to Belfouche, which it did, and uh, the other town uh, has, I think, since disappeared or is, is not much left to it anymore. The contingent that wanted Belfouche, including Seth Bullock, had a big celebration the day before. They had horse races and stuff, and so the next day, all those cowboys voted, <laughs> and that's how they lost the election. Actually, Minnesila, which is a ghost town now, but a little town right outside, was already an established town, and it was a govern governor's appointed county seat. One thing that Seth Bullock did help us do, he was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt's, and we got a big irrigation dam, Belfouche irrigation system, which made a huge difference in the vi vitality of the town of Belfouche. And that's when they were rich enough to do this courthouse, <laughs> which was 1911. The way the final figures I see in the commissioner's notes was, $50,412.51, <laughs> so, which was a lot of money for 1912. And they had did some fundraising. I mean, I think the merchants and the commercial club of Belfouche, they kept calling our old courthouse the shack, which it's not, it's a two-story, it's a fairly big two-story building, but they obviously wanted a new one. And they raised money, they raised, I think, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars privately before they solicited the money from the taxpayers. It's gorgeous <laughs> for one thing. We're proud that Belfouche was rich enough to be able to do it. Establishing a county seat didn't necessarily mean that a community could keep it. Many county seat battles would develop, resulting in accusations of voting fraud, corrupt political maneuvering, and theft of county records. Even threats of violence that required backup help from law enforcement and the military. So they were tremendous battles um, uh, over courthouse county seat locations. And one of the reasons they, they built uh, courthouses the way they did was if you put the money, if the county put the money into building a fancy courthouse, it was less likely that the voters would uh, move the, the, the county seat away from that location. Generally what happened was that the governor appointed the first county commissioners. And that's why all of the, the bribery allegations were directed towards uh, Governor Ordway, that, that he pocketed money to, uh, large sums of money, to uh, uh, appoint the county commissioners. And then the county commissioners would choose the first county seat. And, and you know, it could be moved by a, a vote of the people, but I think it required a two-thirds vote. So once that initial decision was made to place the county seat at, at a location, it was very difficult to get it moved. As the story goes, the towns of Howard, Forestburg, and Letcher, and later Woonsocket had their share of election fights. Minor County, formed by the Dakota Territory Legislature, named Forestburg the temporary county seat with a small structure built to house offices. 
Within a year, a flood washed away the structure. It was repaired and moved to a new location on a hill, but would later be damaged by a tornado. During the 1882 general election, Howard competed against Forestburg to become the county seat of Minor County. Then things got really messy. Governor set up the election, and uh, right at that time, there were some railroad crews that were working in the Howard area, which was way on the east end of that, that combined county. And supposedly with the inducement of uh, some free liquor, the, the railroad workers were all induced to vote in favor of Howard, and so Howard won the election. The minor county courthouse that stands today in Howard was dedicated in 1935 at the cost of $100,000. It's a flat-roofed building with an Art Deco style. Forestburg and the Forestburg representatives uh, were able to lobby the, the legislature, so the legislature cut the county in two so that there would be a new uh, western county which became Sanborn County. The community of Forestburg would enjoy the title of county seat for Sanborn County, but only for a short time. Governor Ordway was from New Hampshire and he didn't like the Dakota Territory summers very well. So he signed the appointments in blank and went off to New Hampshire. And uh, so July 1st, the, uh, uh, the new law creating the new county went into effect and uh, some people from Letcher came and approached his secretary who was susceptible to a bribe as well. And so the secretary who had possession of the blank appointments filled in the names of the Letcher representatives rather than the Forestburg representatives in these blank, blank forms. When the governor returned, he denounced the clerk's appointments indicating they were fraudulent and chose another set of commissioners. Forestburg was once again designated as the county seat for Sanborn County, resulting in two competing sets of officials, both collecting taxes from citizens. At this time, everybody was very disgruntled by the, uh, what was going on, so they uh, filed petitions to have a countywide vote, vote on where the county seat would be. Letcher and Forsberg uh, split the votes from the eastern Sanborn County and the county seat on the, the town who was competing on the west side, which is right on the edge of, of uh, the county, won. And that's why the county seat in Sanborn County is right, right on the west edge because of that, uh, that uh, division that way. Construction of the present courthouse began in 1907 and was dedicated in May of 1908. The building is constructed of brick and sandstone in a Renaissance Revival style with classical revival influences. Gary, of course, is right on the north on the Minnesota border, and when the county was originally being settled, it was the big town, and that's where they established the, the courthouse. But as the population moved further west in in Dual County, people weren't very happy with driving all the way to Gary to enact their county business. So, so Clear Lake became very interested in getting the, the county seat, and and they had several election battles. Clear Lake was, uh, was uh, really the center of the uh, county and sort of a logical place. But Gary didn't want to give it up because they knew there would be economic value for them to keep it in Gary. So there was a lot of bickering, especially between the two newspapers. And of course, the one thing that happened was that somebody from Clear Lake put a post in the ground right out here on the east side of Clear Lake and said, this is the center of the county. This is where it should be. Well, that night then, 
people from Gary heard about it, and they come over and pulled that post out and took the post away. Clear Lake would win over Gary for the county seat in 1890. Clear Lake residents would then travel to Gary at an early morning hour to take the county records. But the operation did not go as planned. Uh, Clear Lake went and seized the records after they thought they had won the election and brought the records back to Clear Lake, except that the wagon wheel broke in the middle of the night and, and so they had to leave the, the county safe with all of their records and apparently the money sitting in the prairie overnight till they could come back the next day and repair the, the wagon wheel. The judge had uh, brought the uh, attorneys for the two parties on trial into the judge's chamber or in the consultation room. And of course the judge sat with his back to the windows. Supposedly on a previous trial, somebody had been really disappointed with that judge. So they drove by the street on the north side of the courthouse and shot at the judge because they, they knew about where the judge would be sitting. But the glass, was so thick and so hard to penetrate that the bullet didn't go through, even though it did make a very small hole in the glass, which is still there today. The courthouse today is the second courthouse built in Duell County, dedicated in 1917. The final cost to taxpayers just over $82,000. It was crafted out of Bedford limestone. Swan Lake was uh, where three families had settled to begin with, and so they're naturally turned into the uh, county seat at that time. I think it was three or four elections between uh, Hurley, Marion, and Parker. The uh, results had to have had a two-thirds majority, and neither none of the towns could acquire that majority. Then there were some hard feelings that Parker didn't have that $10,000 that Marion and Hurley had offered. Parker got the courthouse and it's been there ever since. The Turner County Courthouse was open for business in October of 1903. Like many courthouses, space would soon become limited and by 1922 a new jail, sheriff's office and sheriff's living quarters were added. Spink County War and the Grant County War are two that stand out significantly because of the, the long-term battles that went on between, between towns for the county seat. And in Grant County, particularly between Millbank and Big Stone City, over where the, the county seat would be, and a number of elections and lawsuits in which the, the litigation expenses supposedly ran over $100,000 to decide who would get a courthouse that was worth $4,000. So it was a big fight, much like county seat fights everywhere. No bloodshed, nothing like that, but. So then the next issue became, well, we have to build a courthouse. The county commissioners issued a bond of $75,000. The Evans Company, construction company, built it, went bankrupt or appeared to go bankrupt. So that, that's what delayed the process until 1970. It wasn't dedicated until November of 1917. The building that you see today is what was created. Most of the affix, the, the interior uh, is the same. It's been renovated at different times and it's been repainted and all that, but most of the stuff in there is quite original. They named it after uh, President Grant, who was the president at the time and of course Civil War hero. A lot of the people who settled South Dakota were Civil War veterans. 
And so you see Union County, uh, Grant County, uh, Gettysburg, uh, um, you know, Meade County were all people who were Civil War uh, heroes. Naming a county after a prestigious war hero was a common occurrence, but even a king was honored when counties were being named. Well, there was a big appeal to the Norwegian settlers who were coming into that area. So they named the county after King Haakon VII of, of Norway with the idea that that would maybe appeal to the Norwegian settlers so they would, would settle that and would vote for uh, the, the county seat that they wanted there. While some county seat battles had their share of drama, others are better defined as county seat wars. Well, they had a war, uh, and it's amazing that there wasn't violence there in Spink County. Was the Spink County War was undoubtedly the biggest controversy that uh, a county seat location and, and came close to violence. The, the county seat had been at Ashton, and uh, Redfield, um, thought that they should have won the election and they thought that there was some uh, voter fraud. And so uh, a, a large group of masked men from Redfield went to Ashton and stole the county records and took them back to, to Redfield. As Soon as that happened, and, and you read different figures, but one book I read said 300 armed men and another said 1,500 armed men uh, gathered at Ashton and went to Redfield and threatened that they would destroy the town if the county records weren't back. And Redfield was preparing to defend themselves uh, at gunpoint as well when the governor called out the National Guard and two companies of National Guard uh, came from Fargo to put down the, the war. Uh, also made uh, Redfield give up the records. They went back to Ashton, but Redfield won the next election by a significant majority. And so the county seat did get moved to Redfield. Another community much farther south was fighting its own battle involving community and political corruption. When attempts to get help from state leaders failed, citizens decided to take the law into their own hands. The governor got to appoint the first county commissioners. And generally the governor would do that when he received a petition signed by so many people swearing that they were residents of, of the area and that the, that the county needed to be organized. So in this case, uh, a group presented him with a petition. Uh, ultimate conclusion is that almost all the signatures on the petition were forgeries and that they were just a small group of people that ultimately were called the Brownsdale Gang. They established the town of Brownsdale and uh, the governor, when they presented a petition to him, uh, he appointed them as the county commissioners and they designated Brownsdale as the initial county seat. The, the benefit, of course, is of being the county commissioners, you could issue bonds. And particularly if they were all of the voters and they could approve the bond issues and they issued uh, many bonds that were bought by uh, banks at, at face value and uh, paid themselves extravagant uh, sums. Scotland, which of course is not far from there, the, the, the leading uh, person in Scotland was Robert Dollard, who later became South Dakota's first attorney general. And he became convinced that there was something crooked going on at Brownsdale. And so um, he approached the governor about revoking the appointment. The governor wouldn't do it. And so he led a gang to Brownsdale and they seized the records and, and Brown and his uh, Confederates fled never to be seen again, but probably taking the money with them. So then later, a, a, a later government was established, which uh, established a county seat at, at Grandview. 
Eventually they found out that the railroad was going to go like five miles south of Grand Butte to a new town called Armour and so they moved the buildings from Grand Butte to Armour and, and that's where the, the county seat is in Armour now. Four years after the county seat had been established at Grandview and Douglas County, the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad set up shop in a new town they would call Armour. It would eventually become the county seat. Two buildings were erected prior to the one that stands today. It was dedicated in 1928 at the cost of almost $124,000, which included plumbing, furniture, and fixtures. Governor Ordway was in the process of determining if Falkton or Lafoon would become the county seat for Falk County. The governor supposedly sent a representative to both towns with the message that the right price could win them the county seat. Lafoon provided the governor with a better bribe, making it the winner. But when the railroad bypassed Lafoon, Falkton became the permanent county seat. The building in use today was constructed in 1904 for $50,000. The Hughes County Courthouse, which is not the one that stands there now, but their original courthouse, did serve as the state capitol building and the original state officers were sworn in in the, in the Hughes County Courthouse. And eventually then they got a partly of a frame capitol building built and the, I think all the officers except for the Supreme Court moved out of the Hughes County Courthouse and the Supreme Court stayed there for several years. What makes that uh, courthouse unique, uh, I think, is the fact that, that, a, that a university started in that courthouse. And I, there's certainly no other courthouse in South Dakota, and I have never heard of any other courthouse that, where a university started in there. But the University of South Dakota, uh, they have started the plans for the university. Uh, Old Main was under construction. But in that uh, fall, when the first students came, there was Old Main wasn't done. So there was nowhere for them to have classes on the campus. So um, arrangements were made for the University of Dakota at that point for them to begin classes in the Clay County Courthouse. Meade County was one of the last counties created by the legislature of Dakota Territory before dividing the territory into two states of North Dakota and South Dakota. The county was named after Major General George G. Meade, the Union commander at the Battle of Gettysburg. Fort Meade, a military post outside of Sturgis, is also named after the general. The original building was approved by the county in 1896 and served the people for almost 65 years. The building that stands today opened its doors in 1965, but has already outgrown its space. Many county offices are now located in the historical Erskine Building, which is a former school in Sturgis that was renovated for the county. As communities would win their battles and courthouses would rise over the bluffs, rivers, and prairies of South Dakota, the losing community would sometimes disappear. This would happen because settlers would move away. A few of those towns are covered by the Missouri River. These were towns that at one time had business and potential growth. Today, all that remains are historical markers, passages in history books or oral stories passed down from generation to generation. 
They don't know where the name came from. Out in Charles Mix County, there's two stories that, uh, that it was a cavalry officer who was stationed at uh, Fort Randall. And uh, the other story is that it was the uh, uh, Commissioner of Indian Affairs at that point in time that they, that they named it after. But so, so there's a dispute about where the county was named. The uh, county seat was eventually placed at a town called Wheeler, which was, was a, a river town, again, along, along the river, and, and a wood frame courthouse was built there. But eventually, uh, Wheeler was a pretty remote area of Charles Mix County, and it didn't grow. Eventually, uh, Lake Andes prevailed. A prairie school-style building was constructed and completed by 1918 at a cost of just over $119,000. The town of Wheeler was abandoned when Fort Randall Dam was constructed. The town is now under the waters of Lake Francis Case. Forest City, once the county seat of Potter County, is also buried under the Missouri River by Lake Oahe. The town sat on the Missouri River about 17 miles west of Gettysburg. It was designated the county seat in 1883 by county commissioners. An election between the two towns was scheduled with Gettysburg winning. The courthouse that stands today was constructed in 1911 by the same architect that designed the courthouses for Sanborn and Walworth counties. By the mid-1930s, many of the courthouses in South Dakota were showing their age and in need of major repairs or replacement. A federal program, the Public Works Administration, provided financial assistance for the construction of many public buildings across the country, which included 12 courthouses in South Dakota. Many of the courthouses were 60 or 70 years old by that time and were really showing their age. And, and particularly when the federal government would pay a, a substantial portion of the cost uh, in order to create employment. Uh, the counties were very willing to go ahead and build new courthouses during those um, 30s because of the fact that it would not be, create some employment. Uh, Aurora County is an example of that. Uh, I mean, they, the county acted as the contractor on that just so that it, they could hire all local people and not have a, a contractor who would bring in workmen from away. Th those PWA courthouses were mostly de designed by the same architects, uh, Kings and Dixon, who were uh, architects in Mitchell. While some courthouses, especially the WPA buildings, were constructed more for function than beauty, each building had its own unique features that set it apart from others. One feature that has set some of our more historical buildings apart from the rest is the sturdiness of their construction. At that time, the price that was quoted to build just the, just the building, $52,935 was the figure they were, were given just for the outside and the foundation work and if you really take a good look at that building, there was a, a lot of cement work, concrete work done in the basement. The one stipulation they had given that contractor that the building had to be built of stone. The contractor suggested that they use the old, what they call the Kettle River uh, 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 sandstone out of Minnesota. And if you look at the building, you can tell now where the Kettle River sandstone is at the bottom. Then above that, the contractor wanted to use the, the Bedford limestone out, out of Minnesota. The dome, of course, is copper. To appreciate what's holding that big building up the way it is, is to look in the basement and look at all the concrete that was done, all done by hand. The Marshall County Courthouse is one of many courthouses that have a dumb waiter, also known as a lazy waiter. These small movable carts were controlled manually by ropes on pulleys. They were used to help transport files and other small objects from one floor to another. 
Today, most of the dumbwaiters found in courthouses are no longer used to transport items, but some have found other uses. This is a dumb waiter. It was here from the original courthouse times, but they quit using them. They were on each floor. It was kind of used as a storage cupboard for old documents and maps. And so when we started to do some upgrading to our heating and air system and lighting system, we thought, let's see if there's any more plans. And we found the original blueprints. <coughs> We've had them since laminated to keep. and. Um, they're actually a little different than the way the courthouse is currently built, but it was just pretty interesting. As buildings would be constructed to stand the test of time, others had decorative details that didn't last long at all. In fact, some county commissioners forced the artists to go back to the drawing board. When the courthouse was constructed, the architect had designed into the front stoops of the front of the building uh, a grasshopper on each side of the doorway. The grasshopper was supposed to be eaten out of grain, and we had just come out of the grasshopper period in the early 30s, and grasshoppers, I'm sure you've heard the stories, uh, would eat anything, including the pitchfork handles. I mean, they just destroyed everything in their sight. And so people had a deep hatred, resentment for grasshoppers. In 1940, the county commissioners apparently had had um, enough of it that they uh, uh, headlines read that the county board uses chisels to fight the problem. I'm sure there are pictures out there, but we've never found a picture that indicates that. Early on, county commissioners also had issues with the original murals found in the entrance of the Davison County Courthouse. The artist that the county commission had hired uh, did not meet any kind of standards that they, they had, and the kiss of death for him, I guess you might say, was uh, the cartoon that is shown uh, the guy had a farmer milking a cow from the wrong side and that just insulted all farmers and they raised a stink about it so they took the murals down. The murals would later be replaced and accepted by county commissioners and the community. Lyle Swenson, president of the Mitchell Area Historical Society, also served as Davidson County Sheriff for 32 years. His stories of the courthouse go beyond construction and decor. He once called the building home. It used to be a common requirement that the county sheriff live in the courthouse. To the left here is the old living room that we had and the kitchen just inside of this door. Many times across the state, uh, small jails were either lived in right next to the jail or in a house right next door to the jail. And the jail was left alone. Uh, we would, if the wife and I wanted to go to a movie and there was nothing going on, we might go down to a movie and just lock the jail up and, and uh, there'd be nobody here with the prisoners. Now today you would not even think of doing such a thing, but it was an accepted standard at that time. Well, it was a common thing because uh, they needed to have a guard for the jail at night. And if the sheriff was in the courthouse, then he took the place of the guard or night watchman there in the courthouse. And most of the sheriffs who lived in the courthouses, then their wives got to cook for the, the meals for the prisoners, and the sheriff got paid so much a meal for that. Today, there are still some public safety centers or jails located in or near the courthouse, but many are in need of state-of-the-art technology and have outgrown most county courthouses. Today, the Tripp County Courthouse uses the old sheriff apartment located on fourth floor for storage. Right across the hall from the apartment is where the jail was kept. It still showcases the old jail cell bars, bedding, and even a mural an inmate drew many years ago.
There are 66 counties in South Dakota. Two of the counties are unorganized counties, which is because of the fact that they just don't have, most of the land in those counties are uh, Indian country, so, so they can't collect any taxes on the land. So they do not have money to run a county government. So Shannon and Todd counties are unorganized counties and until they would become organized counties, there would be no county county seat. Um, Shannon um, contracts with uh, Fall River County to handle uh, what little work that they do have there, and Todd um, contracts with uh, Trip, I think, to handle their, their work. The Tripp County Courthouse was constructed between 1920 and 1922, but it was not the first courthouse and Winter wasn't the first county seat. The town of Lamro held that title until the voters chose the town of Winter in the general election of 1910. Once Winter was declared the new county seat, the residents physically moved the old building from Lamro to Winter. It later burnt down, which required the construction of the building that stands today. Tripp County is one of two counties that also serves as county administrator for its neighboring county as it has no courthouse. Fall River is one of the counties taking on the role as county administrator for its neighbor, Oglala Lakota County, previously known as Shannon County. The courthouse in Hot Springs is also one of the oldest courthouses still in use today. And that's one of the four uh, oldest courthouses that's still in use, is, is Fall River County. And it's, it's built out of that Hot Springs uh, sandstone that all the other buildings are. And, and actually, uh, Fred Evans, who built Evans Plunge, was the, the, the contractor who built it and probably built many of those other buildings there, but it was you know, very much in keeping with the, the traditional architecture there in Hot Springs. The oldest courthouse that's still in use is uh, Olivet in Hutchinson County. Uh, the central block of the, of the courthouse was built in, in 1881. Um, as far as the, the, the auditor there told me, they didn't have an architect design it, that one of the county commissioners went down to Yankton and, and uh, uh, bought some generic plans in Yankton, and then they brought it back and decided they needed a second floor, and so the county commissioners drew in a second floor on it and, and had it built. And then later, uh, it's probably the most added on to courthouse as well, because it was, I mean, it was just a square block building. They, they added vaults on either side in order to make sure that they had a fireproof place to keep, um, keep their records. The Lincoln County Courthouse in Canton and the Kingsbury Courthouse in DeSmet are also among the oldest still in use today. Well, actually, that's two courthouses that were, were put together, and that's uh, Wallace Dow designed those, and, and one of the four 1800 courthouses that are still in use in Dakota Territory. But the east part was built, and then 10 years later they built the west part uh, together with that connecting uh, so that people could, could walk from one section of the courthouse to the other. They're, they're quite different uh, in design. Courthouses were often more than just a building where citizens would go to take care of their county business or where important documents were filed. Many courthouses were also considered a place of entertainment. You know, before we had TVs, uh, courthouses were the place where people would go for entertainment. They would go up, if there was a trial going on, the, the whole town would go and watch the trial. <laughs> One of the smallest operating courthouses sits in Buffalo County. Buffalo County for many years was the biggest county in Dakota Territory. 
And at one time, Buffalo County's northern border was the border with Canada. And it was kind of a thing where everything was in Buffalo County and then they would cut counties out of uh, Buffalo's boundaries till it got down to the boundaries where it is now. Uh, there just isn't much court work there. Um, when we've had trials when there, there's no cafe that you can even feed the jurors in, in Gann Valley. Uh, the numbers were such that the, the court system felt that they couldn't maintain a clerk of courts there. So the clerk of courts in Chamberlain is, has been appointed as the clerk of courts for, for Buffalo County. And if, if need be, she can, could travel to uh, Gann Valley for, for court session. Regardless if a courthouse is new or holds a significant historical title, most are considered the focal point in a county and preservation is key. Just the, uh, the awe and uh, grandeur that it represents when you step inside. The feel of those doors that are so heavy you can hardly pull them to get them open. I don't see this building ever uh, changing, at least in the near future, as an administrative home of county government in uh, Coddington County. It may not be the home of the court system in some future date, but uh, it'll certainly be the, uh, the place where people pay their taxes and get all their other questions about uh, county government answered. Watertown had to have had a lot of pride to build a, a courthouse like that, but, but all of the courthouses, uh, they are the center of the community. They're the most uh, distinctive government building. And uh, if you know if they're a courthouse town, they want to keep that courthouse uh, looking good and uh, uh, making sure everybody they don't lose the, the courthouse. I think the majority of them are kept pretty good, uh, but it depends also on the architect who designed them. Um, you know, we have courthouses in South Dakota that were built by top-rate architects. Uh, we have courthouses who, in my view, were built by second-rate architects and uh, uh, one of the architects who designed four courthouses in South Dakota and two of them have fallen down. It depends on the county and how much money they have. County commissioners, I think, are proud of their courthouses generally and if they have the money, they're willing to spend money to preserve the paintings. Um, you know, uh, Yankton, even though they tore down the courthouse, um, the commissioners were willing to spend the money to preserve two of the uh, Axel Soderberg uh, paintings that had been in the old courthouse, and they're hanging in the, in the new courthouse now. And, you know, it's, it's not many places that are willing to just go out of their way and destroy the old, old paintings. Uh, Elk Point's another place, even though their courthouse is a very modern courthouse, they did try to preserve some of the artworks from the walls of the old courthouse. Elk Point is the county seat in Union County today, but as the territorial legislature was making county seat decisions, they designated Richland as the county seat. In 1865, the territorial legislature called a special election and made Elk Point the permanent county seat. Three buildings have served as courthouse in Elk Point with the current building constructed in 1978. Several decorative items and murals were salvaged from the 1898 courthouse, which are displayed in various locations in the building that stands today. Custer County had a wonderful 1883 red brick Italianate uh, courthouse, which was across the street from the present courthouse. And that courthouse was, was quite badly damaged in 1973 during some of the AIM troubles that they had in, there in Custer. And at that time, Custer built a new courthouse across the street uh, from that, and it was just absolutely a cement blockhouse. Apparently that's gotten, people gotten tired of that look over, over the years, and so they put an addition to the courthouse and built it basically on top of that cement block blockhouse. The building today has a contemporary classic look, the result of additions and renovation work done to the 1973 design. 
The additional work was completed in 2011 at the cost of $5.7 million. Pennington County has also invested millions in increasing the size of its courthouse. The town of Sheridan, where Sheridan Lake Reservoir is now, was the original county seat location, but a special election in 1877 resulted in Rapid City winning the title. After fires destroyed two of the original courthouse buildings, a portion of the building we know today was constructed in 1922. By 1988, an additional courtroom and office space was built on the east side. The original Brookings Courthouse built in 1885 was torn down in 1910. The building we see today was designed by the same architect who built the South Dakota State Capitol building at a cost of $890,000. Inside, visitors can take in frontier-themed murals painted by Volga artist Oscar Lee. For those who have trouble getting to the courtroom located on the third floor, the county made the building handicap accessible in 1996 with an elevator extension. Meeting Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines has been a challenge for some older courthouses. The big courtroom with the jury box is not handicapped accessible. And so it's very difficult to impanel uh, some juries because of that matter. And there are other things that accommodate that, like a jury room. And there's uh, steps to get into restrooms on that level. And so it's just very difficult to meet uh, ADA requirements with that facility. And, and just plus the scheduling of uh, court-related matters uh, becomes an issue when we have so few courtrooms to, to work with. It's too bad that we have modern technology in some ways and modern communication. That has had to change the inside of the building. You see wires strung here and cable there. I think you probably noticed some copper shining up there on this side. And uh, they're redoing and redecorating, doing what has to be done preserve it. I don't know if they're going to patch a couple of the holes that are in that dome because when I was up in that dome some years ago there was a couple of bullet holes uh -oh. <laughs> so and they came from the west because this was all prairie land out here and I suppose the dog prairie dogs were out there and they were looking for something to shoot at. Well it was pretty much restored in when we celebrated the, our Belfusha centennial which was in 1989, we restored it. We took down the, the Lady of Justice and had her restored, and so we have done quite a bit of work to it. I was also uh, really intrigued by all of the antiqueness and all of the well-kept and all of the uh, solid part of this building. Without a doubt, it's the best building in Duo County. As folks like Judge Rush and others work hard to ensure the history behind some of our courthouses is never forgotten, communities are doing their part to physically preserve these historical landmarks. Judge Rush's research has opened his eyes to new stories and unseen murals, but his favorite courthouses are like old friends. Clay County has got to be my favorite. I uh, 
had an office in the courthouse here in Vermillion for over 30 years as a state's attorney and judge, and I think probably have tried more cases in this courthouse than any other lawyer ever has. So, so that certainly is a favorite. Um, but the, the courthouse in Oneida is, uh, is, is also one of my favorite. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it looks like a miniature Capitol building there, and it's kind of out in a rural area, almost on the edge of town, and, and yet it looms up there with that, that wonderful, wonderful dome there. And, and my great-grandparents homesteaded in, in uh, that county, so that would have been uh, where they had to file their records, too. The buildings are beautiful buildings. You know, I enjoyed uh, going in and talking to people in the courthouses. Uh, who were always happy to show uh, the, the details of the courthouse and show some of the, the fine points about that. You know, reading these stories, uh, finding these stories about uh, uh, what led to building the courthouse at that location was, was, uh, was very interesting. First of all, that they know a little bit more about the history of their courthouses, and secondly, that they, they have pride in those, that they realize that there is some uh, a background to them, that there's a history, that there's stories that go with each of those.